Yes. A very good evening and a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today this evening for the fifth Inspirit lecture. I am Prakhar, a manager at Entrepreneurship Cell IIT Madras, and I'm honored to welcome our guest for this evening, Mr. Ajit Gulabchan. Mr. Ajit Gulabchan is the chairman and managing director of Hindustan Construction Company Limited. He has spearheaded the company's transformation from a construction major into a diversified infrastructure group of global scale by developing and building responsible infrastructure through next practices. Mr. Gulabchan is also a strong supporter and patron of several technical institutes in India. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. It is a great honor to have you with us. It is, it is my pleasure and honor to be with you. And thank you for inviting me. I'll be more than happy to share what, what you want me to share with you on this evening. This next one hour, I'm all yours. We're all very excited to learn many new things from you this, through this session, sir. It would have been great to have you with us in our institute. However, the last year and a half, and half have been tough on all of us. We have had to spend large chunks of our time at home and have had to adopt to the new modes of communication as we are doing today. So, sir, how did you spend your time during the lockdowns? Were there any new hobbies that you were able to pick up or was it business as usual at your end? Well, you were confined to home because there was a major lockdown, particularly last year. And uh, this year, when since things started opening up again, you got a second wave, the Delta variant came, and it hurt us very badly. And then we had to again go back into lockdown. And as a result of all these lockdowns, you've been very confined. Now, this is quite debilitating, much as it's thanks to internet, thanks to all these various apps like Zoom, etc. We were able to remain connected. We were able to discuss things, take decisions, do a number of things which would not have been possible had this happened 20 years ago. But it's still, you still miss the, the feel of doing things. Meeting people in person has its own advantage. In fact, just to give you, finally, everybody got fed up and the finance minister wanted to meet a few of us, 20, 30 businessmen, and she insisted that it has to now be in person because we've had too many Zoom interactions and we now need to get started with in-person interactions. Mm -hmm. However, some of these things like what you have just done are probably better done on Zoom because you get more people to come, more people who won't have to travel all the way. But maybe you should do it a bit both. Some of them you do in person, some of them you do on Zoom, I think would be still necessary. It would be fun to be able to all come together and discuss things. There's a lot more you discuss. But I must give it to you. I've, I've found one more thing. Meetings on Zoom are very crisp, very quick, and to the point and time. There's no general talk, you know, and therefore, therefore there's an efficiency about them, but without the color of a meeting. Yes, sir. So my question was that, did you l learn any new hobbies during the lockdown or was it just business? Well, you know, it, it is not just business. I mean, I've been fond of basically reading, traveling. I'm a student of history, economics. And so that's, and I'm 73 now, so I've continued to do that. I did not look at any new hobby at this time because really there's not much to do at that time. And uh, I'm not that skilled with my hands that I should try something like that. But so I continue to do this and do my work from, and uh, uh, thank God for very good connectivity. We were able to actually carry out work quite, quite well during this period. It's really inspiring that you continue to work despite the pandemic and also had a lot more free time for yourself. The free so, time gets on your nerves after some time. <laughs> Tell me. So talking about HCC now, when you took over HCC in the 1980s, you were up against several well-established players like LNT. 
So how did you manage to build a name for yourself and what were some of the challenges you faced while expanding the company? See, when we talk about entrepreneurship, I come from an entrepreneurial family. My uncle, Valcha Dirachan, was a founder of many, many important new businesses in this country, particularly in the field of transportation. You know, he, he built the Hindustan Aircraft Limited in Bangalore, Hindustan Shipyard in, in, in Vizag, Premier Automobiles in Bombay, Sindhya Steam Navigation Company. The, 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 that's a very important addition to international shipping that he added. The day that his first ship sailed abroad, is still celebrated in India as India's Maritime Day. So I come from a stable of a family that has always contributed to entrepreneurship, particularly in the context of India. You know, entrepreneurship, as Drucker always viewed, is a unique agent of change. Okay. Where he says, oh, an entrepreneur always searches for change responds to it, and then exploits it as an opportunity. So it sometimes may not be completely new things that are happening. It may be something that has been done, but a change is spotted today and an opportunity exploited today. For example, there was no manufacturing of aircraft in India. There was no manu- Many things were not done. So came with HCC. HCC has been around for a very long time. It worked under the harsh days of British rule. It worked after that in socialist India, which was not easy either. And then when I came on the scene, we were almost breaking out of our socialist bonds and it came into free market. And yet we were dealing with government. So construction was always an opportunity, but a different kind of construction opportunity came. Much bigger projects many, many new ways of doing things, access to higher technologies from abroad, quickly bringing them in. This became the order of the day. And we moved from doing all kinds of projects, small ones, to only very large size projects. That's, that change created a very special opportunity for us. Because let me tell you, project management, whether you have a, a project that is to be done in two years uh, and it has a value of about 10 crores or whether you do a, va- a project which has a value of 100 crores and you do that in the same time, you'll find that broadly the efforts required to do them and the organizational strength required is the same. But if you choose the bigger one, yes, there is a higher risk of if something went wrong, you can get hurt more terribly than in the smaller project. But nevertheless, to get the same value of work, you'll have to do so many more projects, thereby once again bringing too many projects also is a very high risk. So by reducing the number of projects we would do and increasing their size, opened up a new opportunity for HCC. And then, and we could therefore look for leadership in the civil engineering part of the construction business. LNT does a lot more. It does buildings, it does factories, it does many things. Whereas we we took the niche of civil engineering, which is hydroelectric power plants, nuclear power plants, thermal power plants, roads, docks. So we what is known as horizontal. We, we are the largest tunneling contractor outside of Japan in the private sector in India. In, in this part of the world. We're also built more than 50% of India's nuclear capabilities. This all became possible by that one policy of doing larger projects, but fewer projects. And then we could then enter into these areas and build upon that strength. So in some respects, it was entrepreneurial because it saw a new kind of opportunity or change that was required. And we felt we should respond to it because when, when you were doing 80 and 90 projects, everybody said coming down to just doing 10 would be terrible. 
We will not be able to get our turnover. Where will we find the profits from? Please believe me, we, everything improved for us. So that was the kind of change that we took an opportunity to do. We also did a lot more joint ventures with foreign companies because Socialist India had confined us to being only in India and not having sufficient access to new technologies that were deployed in construction. With the help of these joint ventures, as well as taking the services of many high-tech companies for for not just technology, from point of view of new techniques of doing things or getting some of the things done like special pre-stressing systems, etc. We were able to add to our technological content of doing construction. And that gave us an edge in productivity and doing work. Now you have an interesting feature here also in the edition. While we are doing all this, we also did something which nobody had done before. We are the first construction company that had a company-wide ERP. We use SAT as our, as our platform and we introduced an ERP for the whole company. So all information in the company comes to us in real time, whether it is a project right here next to our head office in Mumbai or whether it is far away in the Himalayas at 11,000 feet height in minus 40 degrees temperatures. All of them came to us in real time. So that also gave us an, another added advantage of being able to reach out engineering and technical services to these projects without going there by being able to solve their problems sitting here. I don't know how many of you see the movie called Apollo 13. Apollo 13 was 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 stuck. There was a problem in the, with the, with the spacecraft, and the problem was being sorted out by Houston on the ground here, because they just found out what are the materials they have, how much time they have, and they worked out a problem and gave it to them, and they fixed it at the ship. So that kind of thing became possible because of internet connectivity and the ERP we have. So with these new ways of doing things, new technologies deployed, use of internet to reach out to our project sites, we still haven't reached the next level where our, all our machines will tell us the productivity of the site. All our machines will talk to us directly rather than somebody noting it down. But all this will happen in time to come. So this, this changed the way HCC worked, and that gave us the success to go forth uh, uh, in this period. Yes, but every success also comes with its own set of problems. Uh, and we did go through them, and we had some terrible... We have been through a terrible period because the government agencies owe us a lot of money. And there's no technology we can apply to make them pay. They are a dominant member and they created problems. However, even in that area, solutions are now forthcoming. The courts are seeing that the, 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 this is un, incorrect, incorrect to do this. And I think we are getting good success there too in resolving that problem. So, Essentially, as I said, we found opportunity in large projects and put technology and techniques of doing it differently to apply it to it. Because at the end of the day, you must remember, all innovation practices are a result of systematic hard work. You can't get it just like that. You, you need to, you, you will get a wonderful idea at a flash, but it doesn't, that idea doesn't become work and doesn't give you success till you put in the required systematic hard work, checking every time whether it's working or not. And that's one thing we did very well to achieve where we, where we are today. Your business plan has surely been the reason why HCC has been so successful. So Pardon? you mentioned... I uh, could not hear you. Would no, you repeat? I was just telling that your business plan was the reason why HCC is so successful today. So mm -hmm. you also mentioned about taking up big projects. Yes. So HCC has construction projects in every sector from power plants to railways. 
So which project of HCC are you most proud of and why? Well, there are lots of high technology projects that we do. For example, the tunneling work we do in the Himalayan region, where the rock is very soft. It is one of the youngest mountains. It is the youngest mountains in the world. And there is only one comparable mountain, and that's snowy mountains in Australia, in which you feel like Hercules because you can crush the crop. But that's not, that's not the best starter to work in. It also has many problems while you work there. And so while there are many such technological challenges, which are high, the Burley Bandra ceiling posed us the most, it gave us more name and fame than all the grand work we have done, which nobody gets to see, which is in the Himalayas. And there we were able to succeed. You would be surprised to know it took about 10 and a half years to finish that project. But the construction time for that project has been only three and a half, three years and three months. The rest was all waiting for environmental clearances, agitations, change of design, change of uh, all these things caused delays. And those delays cost more delays and money, money cost overruns. But the actual construction time was just three and a half years. And it's a fine piece of engineering. And as many projects have a certain value, but tall buildings and bridges have a, a little more romantic value because bridges connect people. And when they are beautiful, they add to the landscape in which they are. So they always appeal. They always create a certain sense of you know, people coming together. And from that point of view, the... We were glad that we had the privilege of building this bridge for Bombay or Mumbai. It is, it has now become, if you see nowadays, whenever there's a landmark of Mumbai shown, it is this bridge and no longer the gateway of India, you know. So I think this has been a very special uh, project we got. Second is we built the second, the largest nuclear power plant in, in, in India, which is at Kulam Kulam in Tamil Nadu state, right at the bottom of India. And these are 1,000 megawatt two reactors that we first built. And it's going to be one of the biggest stations. And it's a very unique place, this place. You have these the largest nuclear facility coming up. The second ones are now being built by LNT. But the first two ones were built by us. And next to it is also Asia's largest wind farm. It's, it's extraordinary to see how peaceful and ex lovely the nuclear power plants look and how, how, how eerie the, the, the wind power looks. Huge windmills that are there. It's quite a special site. You guys are very close to there from Chennai. You must plan a trip, a field trip to see this. We would be glad to help you arrange with the atomic energy department for you to see. This is a unique place where both nuclear and, and this exists side by side. This is one. Then there are always special projects like we did this Kishit Gaga job, which is done at record time, 14 kilometer tunnel done very quickly. Uh, there are several such projects that have been carried out in the Himalayan region. Some are in the very, very odd, you know, like, I don't know how many of you understand concrete technology. Most of the time, concrete generates heat when it gets done. So it has to be cooled down in order to be able to, to set properly in dams, etc. These Some of these Himalayan places are so rare that you actually have to heat the concrete in order to make it happen because you are at a very different level. So, so these experiences have been quite special in doing so. We've been the first ones to build the metro in Calcutta. We've been built some of the, like the Faraka barrage still continues to be the longest barrage in the world in, in the Guinness Book of Records. So several such special cases have been a pleasure for HCC to build. And, and, and the utility of these, these has been in, enormous to the citizens of this country. And that gives us great pleasure. After all, our construction company was started to meet the construction needs of India's society. 
And we've, we've been able to do that very well. And it gives us both a privilege at one end and the pleasure at the other to have, to have done that. We worked abroad, but not so much. Uh, we did a large amount of bridges in Iraq, which is where we really worked abroad. Otherwise, oh, oh, oh yeah, that way we worked in Nepal, we worked in Bhutan. We, but we consider that South Asia as part of India, in the sense. We don't treat it as a foreign project. So this is how HCC has come thus far. And uh, its future is now in more technology to be able to do things. These are, again, simple things. You see an ordinary bridge, you, wherever you go, you'll see that the span is 30 meters apart. And there are very thick pillars that, that support this, this, the bridge. Now we are coming to technologies that can make the span 120 meters and very thin pillars because of new kind of concrete, new kind of steel and uh, composites becoming the reinforcement, so lighter and therefore cheaper and stronger. And so with such things happening, you have a completely new way of doing bridges. It's again the same, the height. The, and again, there's one more area where which we are exploring to go in the future, is to do a lot more in, in a factory and then put it up on site. Too much is being done in situ. So we have all this much cement and concrete mixtures moving to site, occupying road space, polluting the area. Can we not do this in a more contained space and then assemble it at site, giving you the same result? Faster, quicker, cheaper, with, but it of course requires new technologies, new engineering designs. And this is where we are, we, we are looking to head in that direction. And we should be able to do so. You will, when you come here to Bombay, you will see the coastal road that we are building, which is part road, part bridge, part link, part tunnels. You will see fairly cutting edge technology being applied here. And to be able to achieve some very good work, LNT and HCC are working side by side on the coastal road. We are doing one stretch, they're doing another. And I think, I think this is what is all becoming quite exciting about it, of the, all the new technologies that are there. It's not one technology. It's not one some new app. The small things that have added up to improving productivity, bring in cost, cost uh, control on things, and this is what this is what is exciting about the job, the civil civil engineering construction. Projects of HCC are surely the biggest, yeah, and the best projects I have personally seen in India. Yeah, we we also then went and we opportunity came in Switzerland to buy a company called Steiner AG, which belonged to a friend of mine, Peter Steiner. We used to be, we met regularly in Davos. We were part of the same engineering construction forum, of which I've been a chair for twice. And Peter was there and he wanted us, we were trying to do work together. And we were not in the building space in India. And whenever we tried, we failed quite miserably. We're good at these big projects. The building is a little too delicate for HCC engineers. So we thought we'll go into a joint venture to acquire technology to build buildings. And having bought this company, but then they got into difficulties, says, why don't you buy it? And that's how we got into it. Now it is it's, it's doing well now. It, we are very happy. We have floated one of its subsidiaries in India to do building construction. But we are now more in the space of real estate and financing of real estate, you know, that kind of business. And we have launched one more platform called the digital platform for construction. So on this platform, we will be able to provide digitized services to construction industry. So everybody need not invest in all the expensive equipment, computers that are required to work this. Some of the important three, 3D engineering projects can be done from a central lab rather than everybody investing in it. So there are, there are such new technology that can be put onto a platform and 
construction companies, other players in construction, suppliers of equipment, suppliers of 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 of, of supply chain of material, all can utilize this platform to work with each other. This is also a new experiment we have launched in Switzerland, and if it becomes successful, hopefully we'll do it in India too. Yes, and you guys will be our partners doing it. There is there is a a university called ETH, which is which is the MIT of Switzerland. It has almost as many Nobel Nobel Prize winners as MIT has in the United States. Einstein has been a a part member of this university also, and they are very 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 advanced in many areas of particularly construction research, which had lagged behind for a while. Except in road ma- road making, where automation came. Now, now again, there's a race on, and we hope to be there somewhere along with the rest of the world. So, uh, that's really interesting, sir. Sir, you were also the first Indian signatory to endorse the United Nations CEO Water Mandate, yes. and you were also an executive committee member of the Energy and Resources Institute's Business Council for Sustainable Development. <laughs> The talk for sustainable development has only begun to gather steam in the last five to ten years. However, building sustainable buildings generally tends to be heavy on our pocket. What are some of the economical economical solutions that HCG uses or India could use to build sustainability? See, that's why we use the word responsible infrastructure. What do you mean? It's just one moment. Azadu, to be there. I wonder how we got through it. Was shut. Anyway, so responsible infrastructure, which means through the whole life cycle of construction, the choice of materials used in construction, the method used for building it, and thereafter how to operate that building so as to give it a sustainability profile through its life cycle. Now, when you look at these issues, they look simple when you put it out like this. But in reality, you need different materials. For example, we are going to one day find that too much glass buildings are likely to come down because it requires slightly different technology. Because glass can create several other issues. Your your air conditioning requires a lot more cooling if you have a. how do we now change that so when you bring so many aspects of doing work together together then you need to do this differently and to make it responsible means afterwards also you can still build something nice and then have a huge cost of keeping it air conditioned keeping it well lit keeping it at night keeping it brightly lit a whole host of costs that you add to it how are we going to cut those down also has got to be part of the study before you get it now we are not always the designers of building but we will have to work with architects to educate them that look these new techniques better be used in your plan of how to construct and what to construct you are deciding but when you do that make sure that you use the kind of materials we are talking you use the methods that we are suggesting so that you will get a more genuinely sustainable building now this is this is a building the same thing goes with infrastructure for example i am a member of the united nations arise workforce which talks of not just responsible but not just sustainable but infrastructure that can is resilient you can build a very fancy pipeline very big dam big bridges all these things you can build but what happens when there is a a mishap a tsunami a terrible storm a earthquake a fire or a man made disaster <clears throat> like 911 what happens then? when these things happen how do i deal with it can i make the bridge such that it can take resist a much higher level of earthquake of course nobody can 
take a nine, nine on the Richter scale and expect, well, you can build it, of course you can, but it'll be so expensive that it's not worth doing it. But you can, with newer techniques, make it more resilient. Second is, can you make it more resilient if something goes wrong by saying, can I, if there's a pipeline, the enemy bombs your pipeline, can I restore it quickly? That's also part of the, 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 the resilience, you know? So adding the concept of not just responsible, but also resilient to the concept of the facilities we construct, you're bringing in new techniques of doing and building again. So this is the, talking back on water bandit. While we did this, we made sure that in HCC, we are, all our projects are water surplus. What does that mean? Because if you have using X amount of water to create the concrete, create the structures, etc., then we must have systems and and water harvesting systems ingrained in the pro in the structure that we build, such that it will re replenish the water that has been drawn from the soil, and therefore, net net you will have contributed the water to the soil rather than used it. Now, why did this come? Because water is like climate change. Water is a very important aspect that we are, we are missing on. Part of the reason you are getting this climate change issue is because you have irresponsibly used water. We need to use water correctly in order that, we, because water is a public good, it's also a commercial good. Technically, when the farmer uses it for making his crop, he's, he's in the business of producing agricultural products. It's a, it's a commercial good. To give him free water is, is, is criminal. He should be able to pay for it. But for public, people that need to have access to drinking water. Now, drinking water, some of it can be paid for. But we are willing to pay 10, 20 rupees a bottle. But when it comes to our tap, we want it cheap. So we need to do this. And then this is not enough. It's not just a commercial and a public good. It's also an environmental good. At least 50% of the water must be left alone in order that it can cater to keeping the environment intact. Now, in order to do these things, we need to study. While we are depleting the water resources, like in Punjab, water used to be on the surface. The river, from the land of five rivers. So, and now you have to go down at least 400 meters before you can access water. This is a terrible state of affairs. But the good news about water is, if by a variety of means, from the very simple low-hanging ways, two very high technology ways, you can actually correct this situation. And like, I don't know whether we'll be able to correct the climate change situation or we'll just have to find ways to adapt to it. Here you can actually correct it. India, except in the Northeast, has almost lost a lot of its water table. And simple, simple things can bring it back over the next 10, 15 years. And I think this is the objective with which I signed on the CEO of Water Mandate, so that we can tackle the very fundamental thing that can help us. And because as construction, mm -hmm. now just for you guys to understand something, how many of you know, tell, tell me, Pr Prakhar? Prakhar, yeah. How, how much, how much uh, water do you think a human being needs per day? Around 30, 40 liters, considering bathing yes, and all else. other. No, no, now I'll tell you, you'll understand with my answer why I joined this. You need 10,000 liters of water per day. You eat 7,000 to 7,500. Your agriculture product, whether it is meat or whether it is pure vegetarian, requires that much water to make. So agriculture is the highest consumer of water. Then you have other, your clothes, cars, bitumen, 
all kinds of manufactured product. They need about 2,000 to 2,500. So 9,500 is the requirement by these two categories. And you are drinking and water for your hygiene. You don't need more than 150, which is what up, about 200 liters is what, what, what New York gets. Or you can need 180 or 160, depending on the kind of quality you give. But the basic point is the all this is doable. The agriculture. Now, if you see the only country in the world that has done really something for water is Israel. Israel uses one-sixth of water America or India or any one of us use. So, by drip irrigation. They have even the word called precision agri agriculture. You know, agriculture is a biological product, so you can't add the word precision. But that's what they've done. So you feed everything to the extent it's needed where it is needed. As a result, you conserve water. The rest of the water which you use for manufacturing can be recycled by cleaning it up and using it again. Even drinking water can be used cycle. So in this way, you can create a, 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 a management of water in a manner that will restore the depleted resources of water, as well as give you, give you recyclable water, which you can do. And it's a kind of product that we were, have set up to do in Lavasa as well. So you see, there are, there, are, there are these new ideas. So from that point of view, I thought that, and I've always believed what we can do in the area, because when it comes to social, we all are there to provide a need of society. So HCC is a social institution. So when you say that we want to do this for society, you know what we mean is we also want to be a good, good member of the community and therefore help. And we can help from our strength. So we know about engineering. So we can help create improvement in water, improvement in something that will give the society that we are responsible citizens and we will work with them. You know, it's a, a corporate responsibility. Though I don't like the word corporate social responsibility, that we are already doing. It's our social responsibility to produce construction services faster, cheaper, better. But yes, when sir. we do this extra work, what we are doing is we are providing the community our knowledge to improve the community's resources. Yes, sir, that's really nice. So, Urbanization in India has expanded rapidly due to growing population and migration towards cities and towns. Yes. India's urban population is projected to grow to around 814 million by 2050. Yes. However, the inability to keep up with this pace has resulted in problems like overcrowding, diminishing resources and environmental threats. In this context, I would like to ask you about what is the importance of urban planning and what, according to you, are the challenges involved in this? See, uh, urbanization will take place. Uh, in the sense, there is no escape from it. Agricultural productivity is growing sharply every now and then. Take in India itself. When agricultural land ceiling was created, a family of 10 people were given 18 acres of land as standard. So it was more where the fertility of the soil was less, like in Rajasthan. And it was a little less elsewhere, but 18 was the average. <clears throat> Now with the green revolution for new kinds of fertilizers, better irrigation systems, new techniques of crop growing and cropping and seeding, you started getting much higher productivity out of that. Now the thing is that 10 people were good enough to manage that land on one side. Now you really barely need just two or three to pitch yes, to that land. Yes, sir. On the other side, those 10 have now become 200. Yeah. 
to the family. And the land, 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 land sizes have gone down. So you have a huge amount of surplus people that are in agriculture, that cannot be deployed by agriculture. That is why they will migrate. So unless jobs are created in urban centers, it's not going to happen. And urban centers, we have, we have done very badly. We just allowed them to sprawl. Most urban centers near the villages where the agriculture is are simply overgrown villages. What we call a kasba is, is just an overgrown village. It doesn't have an economy of its own. Yes. So it's important that our urban centers have an economy of its own. And it was this view that with such a large migration taking place, we are, we are talking of a mammoth migration. And it doesn't migration, like if you and I were to migrate to another city, we will go, we will find a job there, initially stay with some friend or a family member, and then we will look at renting a house. But in India, other than this, the working, working class, wherever there's a job, they just start walking there. And they go and land up there. This is how it yes, happens. Yes. And then you get slums because you have not planned them. This was, it is this requirement that such a large volume of people will move to cities or urban centers in a short time. And the speed at which it will happen is so high that we are going to have a problem. And we are not yet dealing. At least this prime minister began with the concept of an urban, what he called, we have to look at Shahri Bharat. Yes, sir. Of, uh, of uh, not just villages, but of cities. And we should have begun this task 20 years ago. So we need to do it faster, therefore smart. Never mind, it's not necessarily easily achievable right away. But the idea that we, otherwise talking about a city, city was considered a necessary evil. But if you see the world over, all civilizations are from cities. Yes. Whether it is Ayodhya, whether it is Mathura, whether it is Pataliputra, Rome, Athens, everywhere you go, it is, it is the cities that brought in civilization. So we will have to do that. It was this idea behind that Lavasa, which we built the, the hill station. The, the idea was that we build it because there is a need for it to begin with. Second is, if you ask me, what is the fundamental mission of Lavasa? To create permanent jobs, without which the city won't operate. Can it be done privately? Yes. You have heard of a municipal bond market in the US. They raise money. People give money to them and the cities pay back because when cities invest that money, they earn more. So if you remove the word tax and call it services, it's possible that you can get that. And therefore, if you create this approach to doing things, you will then get public-private partnership, because the volume of urbanization that is required is so large, government alone cannot do it. It is virtually impossible. Like you can see in NHA, National Highway Authority. If we were to go the old-fashioned way, we would have had to build an organization five times the size of railways before you could even begin building roads. But here, without having a single employee other than the decision maker, everything else is private. The engineers, consultants, contractors, even investors are private. So this new public-private partnership is an important aspect. And in this area, I'm sorry to say, we are still not debating adequately. How much in a city should the police be? How much private police? How much, how much should be sovereign? So maybe the arrest is with the sovereign. But the traffic management can be done by, by the corporate police. So these are questions we have to still ask. How are we going to do so? Then looking at some of these issues in Lavasa, what we did, we decided how. How do we build this? If you see all the high-rise or the apartment blocks, four-story building, they're all next to the lake. And the more well-off ones who have bungalows, they are further away. 
So you got 80% of the population of that town is on 20% of the land there. So it's a dense city. And it is a walking city. Yeah. And only the rich come in and go. Otherwise, you'll find our present cities, the, the, the not so well off live far away and have to come to work to the main city every day. It's a huge cost of transportation, cost, pollution, whole thing. So to build it the other way around, where you have a density, so you get a walking population. It also has an advantage. When it's dense and walking, it's also a safer place because there are eyes on the street. You go to Delhi, even in the safest place next to the prime minister's home, you feel terrified at walking at 10 o'clock at night. Whereas Bombay, an 18-year-old girl can catch a cab because she's even at 12, she's going through lots of traffic and everybody watching what is happening. So these aspects have to be brought into our urban planning concept and done so. It is with this view we began. The second is also in bringing in the environment. Like we found out that where we were building us this hill station city, is a, there's a lady called Janine Benyu. She's one of the few people who have got the Champion of the Planets Award alongside Al Gore as well as uh, Gorbachev, etc. And they, they worked it out for us that this area near Pune is a deciduous forest, a mountain forest, where the rain comes and the, the, the vegetation that was there was three tired, tall, medium and shrub. So the tall threw off the, the rainwater to go and rain elsewhere, 20%. 20% came down the slopes again, runoffs, and the rest were contained there. So as a result, if you build that forest again and don't bring in anything else, you can. if you go to Lavasa even today now, the ones which are just before rain, one week before the rain, you'll find it's still green because it's built, the foresting has been done that way. A million trees have been planted for the first town like that. So that we learn these things and we use them. It's called a technique of biomimicry. How many of you observed your aircrafts have those wings at the end? Upturned yes, wings? Sir. Yes, sir. It's copied from eagles. It reduces yeah. the drag by 20%. Yeah. Now, this is mimicry. This is not, mim this is imitating nature. This is not being natural, what I'm saying. So using such technologies from nature and from other animals who have been around far more than human beings have been, you learn how do you do these things. And that sciences are being applied. Your lotus is always clean, even in dirty water, because it has a skin in such a manner that when the dove, come, the, the dew comes down, it cleans the lotus. You now get lotus paints for buildings. So they always look fresh. In India, it rains only once, three months in a year. That's why this is a different story. But otherwise, it has helped considerably to improve the cleanliness of buildings. So these are some of the features of urban development. And it must be a job creator. Without that, urban centers cannot survive. Yes, sir. Smart urban development is something that we need to look at. Smart is just smartening it up, okay? Because it helps to do it better. For example, if you're doing traffic management and you have a, prop, a holistic approach with smart management, it's better. If you want to do this recycling of water, so many, for example, water switch treatment plants in now in America and other, are started becoming tourist centers by making them smaller, making them for smaller areas and beautifying them, you are getting a, a sewage treatment plant as a tourist attraction. Not just some civil engineer's design job. We did that in Lavasa for the first time, but for the next, we had these planning. So there are many such new things are coming, how to keep the security, how to keep the density, the spreading, the more the spread, the more the carbon footprint. 
the more dense you are, the less the carbon footprint. And you'll also walk. Yeah. Now you take New York. I don't know how many of you have been to New York, but you've seen it in movies. You will find New York is one of the greenest cities in the world. Because for about a few 10 blocks, which is about two, up to two kilometers, nobody uses anything but walking. It has larger foot, pedestrian footpaths than it has the roadways on most of the, the, the streets. The idea yes, behind it is, it, it is a walking city. So the whole, and then it has also got eyes, so it's safe too. It's much safer. Of course, you need policing, but the basic point is that designs have to be such that urban living space must work with each other, must make you feel safe, must do this, must recycle. And you know, there are many, many new ideas coming into this. this the time here is too short to expound on each one of them. Yes, we, I've done these studies in order to try and put both. Well, there are there are times you you propose, you know, normally this is you man proposes and God disposes. No, God doesn't dispose anything. The bloody politician disposes it. Sonia Gandhi didn't like a good thing happening. So these things go wrong sometimes in our country. Because there's a mismatch. Getting so many people to comprehend how which way we should go, how we should go, is always very difficult. And nobody understands this. And because of an unfortunate culture of corruption, people think something is wrong with everything, you know? And, and, and so things go wrong. But the fact is that it is a lot of thought and idea has gone into what should be an urban center, why it should be, and it can be anywhere. Now, whether then it, Lavasa was a hill station where tourism and natural uh, pathways, etc., and software industry is the answer. That this could be very well a suburb of an industry. New towns will have to be built, which are old kasbas now can be created into towns by providing uh, agriculture as the, uh, the produce, processing as, 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 as their income. Now, I've been to Saudi Arabia where a King Abdullah city is being created. That's on the Red Sea. The, which connects the Suez Canal to the Arabian Sea. The world's 25% of the world's traffic flows through, cargo traffic flows through that. Yes. And today it has to go all the way to Dubai for repairs for the first docking. Whereas if they built it right there, their Mecca, huh, then they will yes. be able to give you shipping, ship repair services, everything from there much better. And, and America, Saudi Arabia has a hinterland with a yes. large population. So, each city can have its reason to be. Yes, sir. That's how so, you... moving on, uh, yeah. according to reports, more than 60% of construction projects in India are delayed. Though a few of the delays are unavoidable, majority of them are due to poor coordination, cash flow problems, and incorrect data and estimates. These inefficiencies are a major problem in the industry so much that it has become a norm to accept them as normal. I believe that entrepreneurs and the startup ecosystem can be helpful in solving these issues. What is your take on this, sir? Yes, we have gone wrong here. We don't do the homework on our projects. Our detailed project reports are very poorly done. They don't take all issues into account, one. Second time, when it comes to implementation, our contracts are not fairly structured. There is a sharing of risk between the owner, which is most of them, which is government, and the contractor or concessionaire, if it's a public-private partnership, is skewed against the contractor and concessionaire, which creates problems. With these two, then there is, after all, physical construction is done on land. Therefore, land acquisition has its own set of problems. So with all these obstacles in the way, projects will get delayed, not attributable to the concessioner or the contractor. And then the government, which should quickly pay for the compensation for the delays, they don't do that. Creating, compounding the problem 
of the cash flows of that project as well as of that those who are doing those projects and many of us are in trouble only because of that so this is something that needs correction i would be te- happy to tell you that mr gadkari has really taken some steps how to improve this so that we can get a little better understanding like by first doing the dprs correctly making sure land is already available there third is using cheaper not cheaper but smarter materials so that you can build them cheaper and faster because if you have to build less foundations instead of every 30 meters every 120 meters you're going to do it faster too so these are things they have taken into account but culturally we have we have not done our job properly government's dominance has created its own set of problems government officers are afraid to take decisions for being charged with fraud that you are taking money to do this these things do happen and as a result we do have a mess at the moment and it is under correction see you must also believe that yes things are bad that doesn't mean this will always be like this efforts are being made to improve it sometimes they succeed a bit faster sometimes it takes a little longer but that is going on so it is the desire of everybody including the government officer in charge to make it better and but he can't do it under the system so some systems need to change some dynamism needs to come and people like gadkari need to come who can push the agenda forward that this yeah it is true it is very important that he does so yes, and in this context we are seeing this that yes you are right this is a problem it's not being tackled adequately is not being done in a manner that we would have liked to see but increasingly as the quantum of infrastructure to be done has increased so dramatically and it is essential if india is to find its place in the economies of the world that everybody started saying no we need to correct this judges have started thinking we need to correct this so we hope that over the next 10 years we see leap and frog improvement in in the conditions of work as we we can put it broadly that will reduce what you just outlined as cost overruns so uh, according to what you adding to what you already told uh, i wanted to ask if there are any emerging startups in the construction sectors that you know about which are working towards helping in making the construction projects more uh, faster in terms of uh, See, no say let me tell you there are not startups as this is the easiest entry level contracting yeah anybody can get in and start working and you don't need to be a civil engineer to be a contractor either you can be anybody so that is going on one however whatever constitutes construction services including materials that go into building facilities including technologies that grow in the design changing design structure of any facility that you are building this is where all the innovation is taking place so there are startups who are now trying to see can i can i provide a procurement st- a platform somewhere can i do this design faster and give it to the people it's in this different multiple little little ways that the whole ecosystem is getting upgraded construction business as such is not having start up with a new way of doing the only recent one one has heard is where elon musk who wanted to create a tube that creates a tunnel you know special yeah. tunneling that's the only one i've heard where something new happens and some extremely high technology has been used for drilling oil in ocean beds yes pressures are high and yet you got to do it so there is some big path breaking technology but they are not for the small okay so not for the small but in these small ways when they contribute you'll suddenly find that this is important the guy who has done it is going to make a lot because that would be required as an essential in every software that is required for construction this is how yes, as i see it will pan out but destructive technologies are now 
Construction has been slow in this area. But I think we are now on a path that every day somebody is thinking, you know, he's probably thinking stupidly, foolishly, but he's thinking today. He doesn't say, I, I don't know, how can I, how can I do construction project, such a big thing, what, this, what can I do is gone. I can do something here. Let me see what it is. Okay, same, some issue, no, to be able to, 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 to sort of search for that change. This search is on. This is my good news. Yes, sir. I think the startups will be successful in the work that they are trying to achieve. So, moving on, we have a rapid fire segment now. So, sir, we'll be asking you a few rapid fire questions. You can ask, answer them in one word or one line, or you can elaborate if you want. Okay. So, the first question is, if you were to recommend one book or one piece of content that has motivated you, what would it be and why? What would it be? Well, I read Drucker. He talks of management. He talks of entrepreneurship. He talks of the fundamentals of business. Because in the end, what we all want to do is, 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 is a practice. And that practice is what is going to make you, whether it's engineering or whether it's pure contracting. So if you read Drucker, you will get an idea into, into to how things can be done. The very fundamentals. He doesn't tell you every little nitty gritty what to do. What is your favorite thing to do in your spare time? For me, I, I, I like to read and travel. I used to run a lot at one time, but that I've stopped doing. So reading and traveling and watching movies or, you know, no, because that's a new form of educating yourself. It's quite exciting. Yes, sir. So what is the best piece of advice you have ever received? I'm going to tell you a small line. There's a poet yes, and philosopher called Goethe. Okay. He has, he has written a little piece in which he says, whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power and magic in it. Begin it now. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power and magic in it. It's really inspiring, sir. Uh, the next question is, over the years, who has been your inspiration or role model? And in what ways have they influenced your ideas and how? See, my first inspiration came from my uncle who started so many things, okay? It, it was within the family. The rest of it, I have no such one individual that inspired you. But you saw a number of individuals with great inspirations to do something. And when I found that, that that exists, I put my inspiration at the center of doing things. And literally, tell, let me tell you, Goethe's this lines have also helped. Yes, sir. So that brings us to the end of our rapid fire segment. So finally, I would like to ask you one question, which is, uh, what would be one piece of advice you would give to students who are yet to begin their uh, professional career? I again will give you Goethe's advice. Whatever you want to do, okay, begin it. You will find enormous support. Do it with, throw yourself into it. Yes, sir. And then you, when you are committed this way, good things start happening. Even the bad things that come, you fight it better. Okay, so that is really inspiring and I'm sure all of us would try to implement this in our lives. Yeah. This has been wonderful interacting with you and I learned a lot from this session as I'm sure our audience members as well did. Once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I could continue asking you questions all evening, but we have already taken a lot of time. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I wish you all and may you all find your place in the sun. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank our audience members for tuning in to watch the fifth lecture of Inspirit. Kindly stay tuned to watch more Inspirit lectures over the coming weeks. A feedback form will be shared in the chat. Kindly take two minutes to fill it. 
Thank you and goodbye till the next session. Thank you. Thank you, sir.